Go. All right, though, we are officially recording. Let's get this started. Let me just pull this up. All right, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Into the Mind. I'm your host, Marlon Johnson. Today, my guest is Jimmy Gold. I met Jimmy through our mentorship with Pace Morby, and he was immediately somebody that stood out to me from the crowd. I remember, if I remember correctly, Jimmy was actually one of the first students to lock up a creative finance subject to deal. From that first deal, it was like watching dominoes fall. I watched as Jimmy gain momentum in his deals. He gained a deeper understanding of the information. His network began to grow. I could watch his confidence in the information grow. Everything was growing at this crazy exponential feed speed, and that's why I was happy to have you on today, man. I want to talk to you a little bit about your experience in real estate so far, where you started, what you're doing now, what your plans are for the future, because honestly, you seem to have a really good head on your shoulders, and I feel like you see the big picture rather clearly. So I'm excited to learn a little bit more about your deeper intentions and to hear your story. So Jimmy, thank you for coming on the show today, man. Yo, thanks for having me, bro. It's, uh, I was telling you earlier, man, it's my first time on a podcast. It, I feel kind of nervous. It's like a, my first time cold calling. <laughs> Dude, I love it, man. Yo, we're going to get you prepared, man. You're going to be on a lot of podcasts going forward in the future. So I'm happy that this could be where it started. Wow. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Man. Um, so a little bit about me is, um, uh -huh. you know, I went the typical route, went to college, uh, did the four year thing, uh, got a, got a degree in computer engineering. Um, and really the only reason why I picked engineering because you hear about the security that engineering or being a doctor and you know a lawyer and all that kind of brings and coming from an Asian family it's like one of those three right um so I picked engineering I didn't really like it I got a job fortunate enough to get a job uh, immediately after college but just like I was just constantly thinking this is not for me this is not for me is there like another way out and here I am working with employed people that have been at their job for 20 years I was like no way this is not for me Right. Um, so what kind of really started this entrepreneurial path for me was when I went to Grant Cardone's 10X conference um, last year, 2019. It was in Miami, I believe. Um, I just went with another friend, didn't know what to expect. And sometimes, you know, in growing up in college or high school, when you hear people go to these business conferences, you think it's a scam or uh, you don't have you're like, what are these people doing? They're wasting their money. Right. And so I just, you know, took a leap of faith, went and. I would say there's, there was some fluff, but I think if anything, it got my mind opened up in terms of other ways of making money, other ways of making it in life, right? There's so many speakers, like obviously Grant Cardone was one of them, Jesse Itzer, who was like phenomenal. Uh, Steve Harvey was there. Um, and just Harvey. hearing these people, yes, just hearing these people's stories, just like, wow, you know, like there's another way uh, to the path of success. Um, and I wouldn't even consider, you know, working corporate could be successful. I mean, if, you know, some people nine to five is for them, right? But for me, I just knew it wasn't for me. So kind of fast forward, I told myself, all right, uh, I think I'm gonna get into like uh, real estate. You know, I, I followed some friends and then they mentioned the word wholesaling. I looked up the word wholesaling, had no idea what that meant. You know, kind of just went down this uh, deep rabbit hole of wholesale, like looking up Max Maxwell, um, looking up, you know, the All In Brothers, um, Car Car Carlos Sal and all them, and just kind of learning about real estate other than the traditional way of you know put it, buying a house with 20 percent down renting it out fixing it flipping it stuff like that um but i would say that after that though i was really like in a stage of analysis paralysis i was thinking man um uh, it's weird cold calling people i've never done that before um you know what are people mentioning words like skip tracing or va i'm like what are the, what does that even mean you know um and so for the, the longest time i didn't really take a lot of action I was just kind of in this stuck phase. And then after a while, I kind of fell off, um, back, went back to my old ways. Um, and then this February, there was a real estate event in San Antonio coming up, right? It's a wholesaling ground zero. I, I believe that's what it's called, real estate ground zero by, uh, by Quentin Forrest. If you guys don't know him, he's based in San Antonio. And I was just like, what the heck? Um, this is going to be my first real estate event. So I just went, learned a lot, of, took a lot of gems from that. And I think after that, I immediately... I think the biggest thing that really struck me was I sat next to a guy and he flew all the way in from Atlanta and I'll never forget his name. His name is Phil. I still have his contact today. We catch up every once in a while, but he was just telling me like, yo, I just, I quit my job. I'm a, I'm a software developer. I work for Oracle, but I quit my job 
spent the next few months just like eight hours a day just pounding through YouTube, learning about real estate and wholesaling. And the next thing you know, he's showing me pictures of like fifty thousand dollar checks, seven seventy thousand dollar checks. I was just like, I think that's probably like the most valuable thing I got out of that event. You know, not to, not to talk anyone down that was speaking at the event, but I was just like, wow, this is real. You know, and he did this just literally a year ago. So I told myself, this is the last event I'm going to unless I make $100,000, right? Because I don't want to be an event junkie where you go to all these events and you don't do any deals, right? Next, you know, I follow all these, I follow everyone I can that I know uh, that is making it in the real estate business. And I come across, you know, Pace Morby. And Pace is just like a dude that you just can easily connect with. You know, he, he's funny, he talks a lot. Um, I definitely am a very talkative person. Uh, and so I just follow this dude. He talks about creative financing, you know, buying deals with no money out of pocket, 0% interest, free houses, free houses. I'm like, what is this dude talking about? You know, um, so he obviously talked about his, his mentorship. And I was like, yo, I got to be in that, man. I got to be in that. Right. Um, and so, you know, lo and behold, me and you, we both got into the mentorship, right? And a, a week going in, I, yeah, I locked up my first subject to deal. And actually, that's not just my first subject too. That's my first real estate deal in general, right? Um, it was crazy because I was, uh, I actually got Pace's phone number from one of his old seller recordings that he used to make public to the free Facebook group. And so I was like, yo, Pace, my name is Jimmy. I'm in your mentorship, bro. I, I'm, I'm about to lock this deal up. I just have a couple of questions. And he just like phoned me right away. He's like, yo, bro, what's up? Like, tell me about it. I was just, just telling him it was my first deal and everything. And he was just so hyped, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I found the deal through PropStream. I just called the sellers up and I was just, you know, it just happened, honestly. Um, and, I, and I just, after that, like, like you said, the kind of the dominoes started falling. Um, within, within, I think, three weeks, I got like three contracts signed. Um, within that first month and a half, I actually got like six contracts signed. Um, unfortunately, some fell through because of like issues with them getting another loan or, um, Sometimes sellers are saying, uh, sometimes sellers kind of ghost and be like, oh, this sounds too good to be true. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I'm trying to still figure that out. But really, it, you realize that how you can use creative finance to be a problem solver. Yes, so that's where I'm at today, man. Honestly, in a Dude. nutshell. Yo, that's crazy, man. I love that. I love that. I, I didn't know your backstory. I didn't know that you came from corporate America. I knew that you still had a full-time job, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. I had yeah. no clue about you going out to like the 10X conference and like letting mm -hmm. that be the catalyst that opened up your mind. Most people kind of always say, yo, it's rich dad, poor dad. I opened that book up and it changed things or Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. But you're the first person I came across. It's like, yo, I went to the Grant Cardone conference. Yep. And you know, like I wasn't necessarily blown away, but it did force me to start thinking differently. I just started analyzing things a little bit differently. And dude, I love that there's a theme with uh, like the Asian parents and the Asian family. Cause right. I talked to Oscar, I talked to you, I talked to a couple of other buddies and they tell me like, yo, it's a real thing. Like your family does put this pressure on you. Like everyone, it's stereotypical, but it's true. Like you really do only have a choice of like three main jobs. You're either gonna be an engineer, you're gonna be a doctor or you're gonna be a lawyer. And mm. if you're not one of those, you're kind of letting the family down. So it does put this pressure on people to feel they have to live up to a standard that they didn't even set for themselves. So it's right. really hard to then at that point step out of it because you never mm. want to let down the people that care about you. So for you to take that step into this whole other field and this whole other realm, that's right. tough, man. But I love yeah. what you said about you sitting down next to that person over at the Ground Zero conference and just looking at it and seeing like, oh, yo, this is a real person. This is a real guy sitting next to me. Like he's not one of the guys on the stage. He's not getting paid mm -hmm. to show me this. He has no vested interest in getting exactly. me to believe that it's possible. So now you can see like, holy crap, it's real. Like I know yeah. that feeling, man, it's insane. It's powerful. Like that right there is the magic sauce because now you're starting to believe it. And once mm -hmm. you start to believe it, it takes off. And then you come along and meet Pace. And it's funny because he always tells the story about you, of you being the guy that, pulled his phone number off of like one of his uh, older podcasts that he did or older interview he did where he just dropped that po his phone number online. Yeah. And you know, it's like, that's crazy I, that you had the guts to write it down, reach out to him and just be like, yo, like most people would be too intimidated. Most people would yeah. put him on like such a high pedestal that they're like, I'm not going to call this guy. Like this guy's going to curse me out, be mad at me. Like, yeah. it's like, nah, man, I'm going to talk to you, bro. 
Yeah, I wrote I wrote down his number, um, but I actually didn't call it right away because I was just like thinking I don't want to call a guy and really I didn't have any questions that I could think of. I mean, if anything, I wanted to think of questions where it's not something I can easily look up online. Right. Right. So I'm a person that definitely believes in the value in the value of time. Um, and I know his time is very valuable. So if I'm going to make it worthwhile, I'm going to ask him a question that I just cannot find it online. You know, I, I think one of the skills I have is being self-sufficient. And so a lot of the, I can easily find answers if I need to, um, through a lot of like just detailed searches in Facebook. I mean, how people, it's people find it so hard to use a search bar in, in Facebook. You know, it, it just kind of like confuses me. It's just so easy or YouTube, you know, or just type in exactly what your question is into right. Google and you'll find the answer. Or did you even you know, try? I, I'm very resourceful. Now. Right. Yeah. Um, and so usually when I reach out to Pace now, it's like very complicated things. And the answers he's telling me is like, wow, that's like next level stuff. Like I, I would have never thought about that, you know? And I think that's the valuable, that's the value of the mentorship, right? You have access to someone like Pace who can give you answers that are not, that maybe can be found online, but you probably got to uh, like scavenge through like hours and hours of videos or forums, you know, whereas he's already done it through real, real life, right? And so, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I was actually reading this morning and something I came across in my reading, it basically states when you get a good mentor, you're supposed to observe them and you're supposed to copy and mimic them. And at the end of like, let's say you spend a day with them at the end of the day, you let them know like, okay, this is what I observed. And you're going to give them a whole list of things. And a good mentor is going to be like, all right, great. I'm happy you saw all that. Here's what you didn't see that I also did. And that's right. what Pace really is good about providing. It's like, all right, cool. Yeah. You guys got all of this. And now here's all this other stuff that just kind of went over your head that you should right. also really be aware of if you want to truly become a master of this. Right. So I love that right. you picked that up and you are self-sufficient, which is why he would obviously want to work with you. So right. let me ask you before joining up with like the sub two squad and really finding pace, where do you think the real estate game would have been taking you? Like what path were you on before that, before you came across pace? Uh, for me, so I was pretty, I was a big proponent of, um, or big supporter of the burst strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's from listening to a lot of bigger pockets podcasts. They're like a huge support of that. Right. And so I bought David Green's book of, you know, the Burr book. Yep. Basically he just talks about the, like the full strategy and essentially, you know, I mean, you guys can like look up Burr, but essentially, you know, it's, it's buying, uh, rehabbing, uh, wait, no, it's buying, renovate uh rent refinance and repeat right and essentially the process the process of that is it sounds great because you can pull everything out and it's essentially almost a free house right if you think about it but it, it does take time um and so i was just thinking man i, I want to go through a burr uh, but really i wanted to get into wholesaling first because wholesaling i think is like the gateway to everything right you, you have the, the biggest thing is real estate is you know the deal you make your money when you buy. That's the most common, that's the most common saying, right? And so wholesaling allows you to really do go direct to sellers, find the best deals, cherry pick the best deals that you want, keep them. So that was my whole mind mindset at the time. Right. Um, and so my goal was to wholesale a couple of properties, build up enough cash to where I can do a burr. Because burrs, like where if you go hard money lending, they still require 20% down, depending on who you go to. Um, so that was my whole thing at the time, right? Um, but seeing all these people that you hear about have so many accumulate so many doors in, in in one year it's just like how can i supercharge this right um and so that's why you know creative financing you know it, it it's insane how many houses you can buy with literally like with twenty thousand dollars right you know, if you if you know how to play your cards right and it's just it really literally blew my mind dude i mean yeah i'm there with you like i just recently last i think you saw it on facebook i put it in the group i just locked up my first creative deal last yeah. week Congrats, absolute bro. free house man y'all appreciate it man but mm -hmm. it was a free house so now i have proof of concept and i'm like holy crap like first right. off like you i now see it works mm -hmm. like holy cow it works and now it's just like yo this is scalable like free is like extremely scalable right and now right. it makes sense how these guys are able to just spread like wildfire. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily a matter of what you have, it's what you know and the right. team you have around you. So that's right. crazy. So one thing I noticed, Jimmy, is like you like started this to be like 
or not to be a wholesaler, but you started this with the wholesale mentality. Mm -hmm. And the more I listen to you talk, the more I watch you interact with people on Facebook, just, and the more I watch what you're learning, I see that you're becoming a full fledged real estate investor, like a true master investor. You know, the other night we were talking about you heading out to the golf courses and talking about private lending and different things of that nature. So what's up with that? Are you looking to be a full fledged master investor now? Where are you aiming this vehicle? Absolutely. So right now I'm still currently working my nine to five. Um, fortunately I work for a tech company, so we get to work remotely. And so I'm not going to lie. I use some of that time at home to, you know, <laughs> work on my side hustle. Right. And so, yeah, the goal is to become a full-time investor. Um, and, and really my short term goal. So I have a short term goal and maybe it's just not me thinking big, but I think this is a good goal to accomplish so that I can get out of the, uh, my W2, right? And that's to achieve $5,000 in passive income. And that's not saying much, $5,000, a couple of doors will do that, right? Um, so I'm, I'm like almost halfway there, uh, fortunately, um, but it, it does take a lot of time and effort. But I, I think that if I really just picked up the effort, I, I could easily get there, right? So getting to that point, $5,000, it allows me to relax or not relax, but kind of leave my job knowing that I still have income coming in and really going all out with this real estate deal. Right. So yeah, like in terms of real estate investing, uh, a lot of my time is spent listening to podcasts or reading books and it's not just technically pertaining to real estate, right. It's pertaining to tax or estate planning, you know, stuff like that. So really I am trying to, build my life around this real estate stuff so I can, you know, build generational wealth and make sure that my family's taken care of, you know, um, I, I truly believe land is the most valuable thing on this earth, you know? Um, so with, with that in mind and, and I actually enjoy it. It's something that I enjoy. It's, I enjoy helping people. Uh, I enjoy seeing the deals come in, especially when they're so cheap to buy. It's, it's incredible, you know? So yeah, that's, that's the goal right now, man, to be a full-time uh, real estate investor. Um, not a wholesaler because at the end of the day, man, I mean, I, I don't, I'd rather take a slow dime than a quick nickel. Yep. Oh, that for me, at least, you know, obviously there's certain scenarios, but with creative financing, you can do both. That's what's so great about it. No, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Cause you got like with the creative finance, you get to be at the position where you never have to leave anything to waste. It's kind of mm -hmm. like the native exactly. Americans like that used every bit of the animal when they went hunting. I feel like right. when you start learning creative finance, you now come across a deal and you can literally like there are so many options that you can do just about anything. As long as the seller builds a relationship with you, you can serve them in any possible way with their problem and their issue. Right. Right. And, and oftentimes it's just you really just, you know, chopping it up with these sellers. Sometimes they just want someone to talk to, you know, there's a guy that um, I got under contract. It, it would have been such a sweet deal though. Um, but I, I, I can't stop thinking about that. But every now and then I follow up with him, you know, just say, Hey, how are you doing? You know, like, you know, what you up to? And then sometimes he'll just call me and we'll just, you know, catch up and, you know, talk like a bunch of old dudes over just drinking beers <laughs> together, you know? Um, so it, it's really cool, you know, just being able to talk with these people and, you know, you learn a lot of stories about these people. Dude, absolutely. Yeah. I got, it's funny. There's a woman I'm helping right now where she was in a situation with a pre-foreclosure and unfortunately we, she just reached out too late. The judgment was already passed, but it was a predatory lending kind of situation. They gave her some hard money on her home that was already free and clear that she, they knew she was going to use to pay for her daughter to go to college, to go to law school. Mm -hmm. So it's just like no one in their right mind should be giving you a hard money loan to pay for a college. Yeah. But they did it anyway. She didn't realize what she was signing. She was an older woman, Damn. an older widow. Yeah. And although we couldn't do anything as far as a deal with her house, I'm still working with her because she wants to expose this story so that other older people in the community don't get mm -hmm. affected by this. So I've been mm -hmm. going, talking with her, helping her write up a little thing to the news. And now what she keeps telling me is like, when I go to church, I tell everybody about you. And she's like, I have friends that like, they wow. need to sell their house. And she's like, they're not even in trouble. Like they just are ready to retire and they want to go to Florida. And you know, I, wow. I keep telling them yeah. about you and they need to come talk to you. And wow. I'm just like, all right, cool. Like this is really, it came from just like you said, chopping it up, being a person, being a human that's there to listen and help these people through. So right, that's right. really rad. Let me ask you, Jimmy, with your growth, like as you're starting to step into this world, you're stepping into something that's not as mainstream. You're becoming a real estate investor. You're thinking differently. You're seeing opportunities everywhere. 
How has that begun to affect your social network? Have you been finding that you're hanging out with different people now? Are you still friends with the friends that you were friends with before? Or are you like finding that that circle is beginning to change as well? What's that look like? Man, that's a great question. Um, because yeah, I, I definitely have seen a change. Um, so, you know, I, I have like a, a couple of close group of friends that I, I continuously talk to. Um, but ever since I kind of got into this, uh, onto this journey, you know, uh, my, my presence in those groups definitely has kind of been diminishing and people have noticed that, you know, um, like for example, it, I, it's gone to the point where I, I put these people and these are some of my closest friends, right? I, I put these group chats, unfortunately, sometimes on mute, right? Um, just, just because I, I don't want to make sure that I, I want to make sure that I'm not too distracted um, because sometimes they can blow up and, you know, there's good conversations, but sometimes there's just conversations that I don't need to have at this moment. You know, so me, I'm constantly on my phone. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a bad, I have, I have a habit of really, really just being on my phone constantly, right? And so part of that is if I'm seeing these texts, you know, I want to engage and talk all the time, right? And so for me, it's just really understand, like I said, right? I'm really understanding the value of time, right? So yes, like now, like, you know, I talk to, I really, I guess I engage on purpose more now with people in the sub two mentorship, right? Or people that I know that want to just talk real estate. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to see what, pick their brains, but at the same time, I'm trying to give value back too. But that helps me learn better because, you know, Pace talks about, you know, you really learn how to master something when you're able to teach someone, mm -hmm. you know? So um, I definitely am more than willing to talk to these people. I mean, people from the sub two mentorship reach out to me it's like then they get my phone number two from the directory and I have no idea who's calling me. Right. So I just pick up the phone and there are days, man, where like, I have so many calls from people asking me like, yo, we have a question about this. I have a question about that. Now it's getting to the point where like, yo, can you talk to my sales for me? And I'm like, in no way, like on that pedal still yeah, but it's just like, you know, all these people reaching out and I have no problem giving back. I definitely engage with these people, but to answer your question, yes, my, my social group has definitely changed, but at the same time, I, I know that it's not good for me to burn those bridges, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, they're still my friends. And I know that, um, you know, they're always going to be there for me, but they have noticed that I've been less present, you know? And I'm sure you've dealt with the same thing, probably. Dude, big time. I mean, and that's what I think is when you get an opportunity to see who your true friends are, who the real, real friends are, because the real friends are going to notice that you're absent and they're gonna miss you, they're gonna want you around, but they're not gonna make you feel guilty about not right. being around. They're not gonna call you out on it in a negative way. They're gonna always leave a space for you to return and come mm -hmm. back to, and they're gonna support the fact that you right. got up and went. I know a lot of folks kind of deal with when they begin to change and they notice that their friend group almost starts to turn sour on them. So they try and go back and fix that. And mm -hmm. I'm just like, well, if you're seeing that your friend group is turning sour, if they're starting to get mad at you, pissy at you for right. switching up and trying to better yourself, in my opinion, that's not someone I would even call a friend anymore. Right. At that exactly. point. By definition, you don't fit my criteria of what I believe right. a friend is. So <laughs> it's cool to see that you notice the same thing that you put your group chats on mute. I do the same thing, man. It's like, yeah, I used like, to, I used to be the one that's like, be a life of the party in these groups, you know, I would just like talk it up and, you know, try to see when's the next time we can hang out and stuff like that. And now it's like completely shift, you know, um, I, I hate to say it, but I rarely engage. Um, and I try to, I try to follow up when I have time and, and just try to, you know, say something, but you know, the, the good thing is, um, I, these are my true friends. And what I mean by that is they understand, um, that I'm busy and that I'm trying to work on myself. So, you know, there's no hard feelings or like, damn, bro, like, there's none of that you change man or you know where have you been you know it's none of that you know it's all great i love that so the other night we spoke a little bit briefly about how you started getting into golf actually during this quarantine yeah um you know what's up with that because a lot of guys our age we don't necessarily get into golf most of us look at golf as like that old man sport like you're an old white guy that wants to go out and smoke his cigar and mm -hmm. talk about his corvette and you know, but I think we're starting to see that golf, it's just a different world. Being a part of that network has a lot of upside. And then also personally, I know you were saying it, you like golf a bit. I love like playing golf. I learned how to play in college and I'm like, yo, this is actually a lot of fun. But uh, what made you decide to pick up a golf club? 
Man, um, so I've always, always enjoyed watching golf. Uh, so when I, when I used to uh, live with my uncle and aunt, my uncle would always watch, you know, every tournament that Tiger Woods was in. And it's funny because my uncle kind of looks like Tiger Woods, right? <laughs> not, not, not even joking, right? He's like the Asian version of Tiger Woods. But, but uh, we would constantly watch golf. And so because of him, I got kind of just watching it. Um, and I was just like, man, that looks so, you know, definitely golf, is cons- I would say, considers the hardest sport ever, right? Um, which is, I, I totally agree with that. It's very yeah. hard. Um, but the, the main reason why is because I told you, man, I, I totally understand the value of time. And I also understand that there's a purpose, there should be a purpose for everything I do. Right. And then we talk and when Pace is a big advocate of having private investors fund his deal, that's why he's able to buy so many properties because he has a, a, a pool of money that he's able to deploy. And so me thinking like, man, how do I get access to that? Right. And, you know, the, 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 the common conception is, of golf uh, country clubs is, you know, all those people are, are rich people, rich doctors, lawyers, whatever, right? They, they have money. They're there because they want to hang out. Maybe they want to get away from family, right? Smoke a cigar, chill at the country club, play a couple rounds of golf. Um, and so I was just thinking, man, that'd be a great way to network with these people so that I can have private capital, right? Um, and it's crazy because um, I, I reached out to one of my uh, friends in college. I still talk to him a lot, though. But I was like, hey, I, I, I've seen that you're playing a lot of golf. Bro, can you teach me? And then we just started talking. He's like, yo, you know, when I go to these golf courses and I play by myself, sometimes I just go after work, long, stressful day. I just want to decompress. Um, and I book a tee time, right? I book a tee time, and then I'm, I'm, I'm paired with these other groups of people. And mind you, I'm going by myself, but I'm grouped up with these pair of people, right? And so the first thing that they always ask is, what do you do? And so I think that's a, like when he told me that it's just like a light bulb went off in my head. So that's a great segue for me to be like, oh, you know, that's funny. You ask him a real estate investor um, and then what do you do? And then like I can just envision going in from there and just be like, hey, you know, you know, would you be open to instead of leaving your money in the bank and you're actually losing money because inflation and you're getting inflation is at a high rate right now because they're printing money for these stimulus checks. Oh, yeah. You know, and so would you be open to getting, you know, six to 10 percent interest rate, you know, but that's actually not how my conversation would go because I've actually had conversations with private investors and I actually never give my terms away. Same thing with sellers. I don't give my price away. It's always like, what are you looking for? Are you looking for a long-term investment or a short-term investment, right? And so like from those kind of conversations, I got $20,000, right? $40,000. So I have a good pool of reserves that I'm able to deploy right now, right? Um, But I just know going into golf would be easy access to all of that. Uh, but I told myself I want to get really good or pretty decent to actually be able to conversate with these people. Because, you know, when people start noticing, like, um, like someone's really good at a sport, they're like, oh, man, you know, where'd you learn how to play golf? And it's just kind of engaging. And obviously, I want, I'm just competitive, so I want to whoop people's butts, <laughs> you know. But that, uh, that's honestly the, the main reason why I got into it, right? They're, like, obviously, quarantine, people will start picking up hobbies. And maybe you might have picked up some, you know, another hobby I picked up is cycling, which is so weird, but, oh, you know. Oh, word, dude? Yeah, cycling. Oh, like, I bought, a, I bought a, dude, yeah, I bought like a, a rod, bro. yeah, I bought like a Cannondale race bike um, used. And so um, now I just, that's my form of cardio, right? Because I, I, I sometimes go to the gym for cardio. And now that gym access is kind of, I mean, you can go, but it's kind of frowned upon, right? So I try to go cycling um, just to, just to help with that. But yeah, that, that's, that's, um, that's the main reason why I picked up golf. Yeah, I love that. So I like that you're very intentional. I like that your time, how you spend your time, you think about, okay, where am I going to get the best ROI on it? And I really enjoyed what you said about not giving out your terms, not giving out your price, because I'm sure that this is something you also recognize, like you said, when talking to sellers, that you don't give out your terms, you don't give out your price, you don't give out what you want. And I think this is where a lot of people screw up in every business across the board like Mm -hmm. just people immediately come to the conversation with what they have in mind and they want to get it out as quickly as possible because they think it's so awesome they think it's so great and they never stop to ask the person across from them what it is that they actually want and then shut up and let them talk yeah here's what i'll tell you here's what i'll tell you what this is this is how that concept really stuck with me right it's actually when i had a conversation with pace um so uh, I was just, uh, we were just texting and I was asking him because I think I was trying to get him. Um, I was saying, Hey, what's your buying criteria? Right. I was like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to market to, I know you buy deals in Phoenix, Vegas, and, and Florida, you know, what's your buying criteria? And then he goes back with, well, what are you looking to make? You know? 
Um, and then it basically the conversation, like he, he basically never gave out his, his criteria. He never gave out what he was looking to pay for a certain deal. Cause I was like, man, I could, in my head, I was thinking, man, I can just buy a bunch of subtues and assign them to him. Right. But he never told me how much he was willing to make, like, like how much he was willing to, um, purchase for. Right. And then at the end of our conversation, he was just like, you, uh, so you see that I practice what I preach, right? You never give away your price. Right. And so I know he does a lot of seller recorded calls, but that, that was the moment that was like, wow, he literally practices what he preaches. So even when he's talking to a seller, even when he's talking to wholesalers or private investors, I'm sure he does not give away his terms ever, you know? So that's what really catapulted me into talking to these sellers. And now when I talk to sellers, like, for example, I just, I just got a text from a wholesaler, right? Cause he, he referred me to a lead where the seller wants too much. So I talked to the seller and I specifically said, okay, Think about the terms that you want, like the down payment, um, the monthly payment, and you know how long of a term that you'd be willing to finance. And then the wholesaler got back to me. He's like, yo, um, what was the price that you gave them? I was like, I never gave them a price, bro. Like, I asked them to think about the terms that they wanted and to come back to me, right? Um, and so literally, I, I, like from now, like that really just changed my mind, just that one conversation with him, you know? So... Because I think Pace, what he says is true. Like the one value that we have to these sellers is our price. Once we give that away, they can ghost us and chop around. Yeah, Yo, you're absolutely right. And what's even cooler is when you let them make the decision on what it is they want, then they now are in a position of feeling like they're in the driver's seat. They now mm -hmm. feel like, okay, I'm being heard. I got to state my demands. And now we're working from my playing field. And that's all the difference. You always want to put people in a position of like, I find that the greatest people in any business, in any industry, the real leaders and the real moguls, they're the people that look at it like, okay, here's a scale that's perfectly balanced, 50, 50, me on this side, you on this side, I'm going to tip the scales and I'm going to bring myself down and bring you up a little bit because yeah. you need to feel that you're in a position of an advantage and then we can work together. And I'm willing to take less because this isn't the only thing I have going on. I think right. we need a bigger picture and I have a million of these sort of transactions happening all over at the same time. Everyone right. else is trying to be in this position because this is all they have going on. This matters to them so much because if it doesn't work, they don't have anything else. Right. And that's ultimately why they end up not making the deal and not getting the deal or they don't ever scale to the place that you and I see that we're trying to scale to. So right. dude, like I straight up, I love the fact that you have this big picture idea in your head that you already mm -hmm. sort of see, okay, like, you found the right person, you found the right mentor as far as pace, and then you're actually implementing what it is you see him doing. You're mimicking it and you're finding that it's working in your own business right now. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I'm a great visual learner, you know? Um, so what I mean by that is um, I'm teaching, well, I'm teaching myself how to play golf, right? And so mm -hmm. I've, I watch a lot of YouTube videos. And so I think I have a really good hand-eye coordination. So I, I try to mimic everything that a professional golf player does. When I, when I mean by that is the wrist, shoulders, the, the hips. So when I'm talking about, I'm a visual learner, right? Same thing with pace. We, we have, we see pace talks to sellers, um, on, you know, on Mondays or whatever days he does now where he talks to sellers for us. And so I kind of really just understand now that I can see him visually doing it. It's so easy for me to emulate that. So easy. You know, I, I don't even take notes. Like, you know how there's people in our mentorship that take exactly word for word where he writes down. I don't even like, I promise you, I take no notes. Right. And so I'm very good at just visually intaking everything and then kind of putting my own spin to it. But, you know, Dude, I because feel at the like, end of the day, you're just having a normal conversation with these people. Right. If you have a script, then you'd be like, OK, oh, my gosh, she said this. How do I respond to that? That's that's not me. So I really just internalize everything and make it my own. Dude, I love to hear you say that, man, because that's something a lot of people, I think, don't pick up on. And that's why, like the other night you were telling us, like how you love cold calling. And recently, like I've been finding the same thing. I'm just like, damn, like. I remembered when I absolutely hated this and I was terrified to pick up the phone. And now like, it's, it's fun. It's easy because you could just have a conversation because like you said, watching pace, get on the phone with the sellers and seeing his face, seeing the facial expressions. And you just saw like, he's chilling. He's calm. He's just having a conversation half the time. He's like twiddling with something or he's doing something else. And I was like, yo, you really can just be that relaxed while doing this. Like it's not a big deal. And exactly. saying that it wasn't a big deal demystified the entire process. And it was yep. like, yo, you can really just, just have a conversation with another human. If they yep. want it, they want it. If they don't, they don't. But if you make it a big deal, your energy is going to end up pushing this thing away. You're going to end right. up taking out of right. forgetting it. Right. 
I mean, I've had people hang up on me in mid combo. I've had people um, cuss at me like, "How could you? How could you ask someone to sell their house in a time like this?" Yep. You know, but that doesn't bother me at all one bit. You know, um, even if I saw them face to face, it still wouldn't bother me because at the end of the day, I'm just here to see if I can provide value to you. If not, no problem. I can move on, and you know, maybe I'll follow with you in another month. All right. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's the beauty of it, man. So let me ask you, because I want to dive in a little bit to this. You said the other night, you know, that you, after a couple of first deals, you went out, you got a VA and you had a VA hitting your list for you and calling. And recently you actually got rid of your VA and decided that you're going to be the one that cold calls. What mm -hmm. sparked that decision? So I, I would say I'm at a, I, I'm not at a financial position to where I can expend money in that area yet. Um, and so when, when I said I love cold calling, okay, I don't actually like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to pick up the phone. Not like that, right? I, it's, it's a task that I enjoy doing, but at the same time, it's, there's times when I get like, oh man, I don't feel like picking up the phone today, right? But I don't mind it. I definitely don't. I know there's people out there that I like, just hate it so much or are very fearful of it. Um, and I just know I'm, I'm good on the phones. Uh, and, and that's not me bragging about myself. I just know that I can keep this, if I can keep the seller on the phone for more than 10 minutes, and just engaging and just letting giving them information that uh, giving them information to me then it's you know I, I think that's pretty good so in terms of the VA I was listening to some of the recorded calls and it's just like I basically what I did is I uploaded the TTP script for her to read right um, and the VA also had a manager right and so in my head the manager was like okay I think the manager is going to train the VA um, and you know kind of adjust week after week I'm listening to the recorded calls and it's just like right off the script which is no problem but then when there is a response that's not on the script she doesn't really know how to respond um and so it's it's there's a lack of building rapport there's a lack of just having a normal conversation um and you know she was based in the philippines and i was saying that you know having like just the american language not only comes with obviously like the grammar and everything but just like that um what's that word it's basically like there's like a a niche to it you know mm -hmm. just to how to talk to these people just to have a normal conversation you know um and so she really didn't understand that and which was no which was fine but at the same time if i'm paying someone to do this i would expect there to be some sort of, some sort of skill set that came with that and i don't think she had that at that moment um and i wasn't willing to expend more of my time to train her because i thought the manager was going to do that right and so I, I'm paying, but I don't expect a lot of my time to go towards this VA, at least yet. Um, but I guess my expectations were not set um, because I thought that I can just kind of pay someone and then I would just get leads coming in. I don't really have to expend time as well. And right. that's just not something I wanted to do. So I found myself to be more effective to be on the phone. Um, and I know that, you know, I don't have a lot of time to expend because of my job. But at the same time, whatever chance I can to cold call, I would do it. And I get pretty good contact ratio, man, to be honest. And so when I do, um, then I, I don't mind, but I think when I scale, then, then definitely, you know, but I'm, I'm not at that point yet. Uh, I like to hear you say that because I think that's uh, something that people don't really talk about because everyone's constantly selling the next big system or the way to do the business bigger and better. But ultimately like, yeah, those things work, but if you're not in a position to utilize it yet, it's not going to work for you. So you can have too many tools. You can have too many systems. It's kind of like giving the apprentice all of the tools and all of the keys to all the vehicles on the job site. Like, yo, he's going to end up screwing things up even worse. Like just give him a hammer, give him a screwdriver, let him figure right. those things out. Let him get really good with that. And then as time goes on, start to introduce him to more. So I think a lot of people get into that position of feeling like, yo, let me scale quickly, quickly, quickly. I know when I first started out, I came from a, when I got into real estate, I actually came from a training program, a real estate training program that tried to give you all the tools at once. And at the first like month or two, I was just like, why do I even have all of these tools? Like I'm not utilizing any of this stuff yet. And I'm praying right. for it. This makes right. zero sense. Yeah. So it's like, I'd rather start from the ground up and build like you're saying. Exactly. So let, me, let me ask you when you're making the cold calls, right? Do you have any sort of, cause like you said, a lot of people hate cold calling, like without a doubt. And everyone, if you're in sales, you know what cold calling is. doesn't matter if you're doing real estate. doesn't matter if you're selling cars, like gym memberships, whatever, you know what cold calling is. And nine out of 10 people 
absolutely hate it. But the yeah. people that excel, they figure out a way to enjoy the process or to do it anyway. So do you have any sort of rituals or anything like that that you use to get yourself ready to jump on the calls? Um, it, it's funny you say that because um, one of my favorite movies is Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's probably like my top three movies of all time. Like, I, I love that movie so much. And basically, um, you know, when he, there's a scene in my head where he um, basically, the feds are onto him, right? And he's about to leave the company. I, I, sorry, spoiler if I'm spoiling this, but I'm sorry. But he, there's a point where Jordan Belfort or Leonardo DiCaprio was about to leave the company because the feds are onto him. And basically he was gonna take this, this deal where if he left the company, then they wouldn't really go after him. He'd pay a couple fines and that's it. And then, um, yeah, no, that's a different scene. I'm sorry, that's a different scene. Basically, it's a it's a scene where he's on the mic and he's like motivating his his uh, his yep. his workers, like, hey, you know, do you are you behind on your are you behind on your bills? Pick up the phone and start dialing. Is you know, does your wife think you're a worthless loser? Pick up the phone and start dialing. And so, like in my head, that just plays over and over, and like that that just pumps me up. Sometimes I pull it up on YouTube, but I I've watched the movie so many times that I think I've internalized that specific scene in my head you know, um, and, and just like, you know, pick up the phone and start dialing because, you know, what do I have to lose, you know? Um, so that's kind of like what goes into my head definitely when I, when I definitely uh, start to cold call people. Um, and it's just like turning to, cause like, man, it's just so motivating. Like you just want to cold call now, you know, you want to cold call because when you cold call indirectly, that's going to lead to a Rolex. That's going to lead to a nice car or whatever, you know, that's how he made it seem. And I was just like, wow, that's, that's definitely, um, hyping me up at this morning. Dude, you know what's crazy, man? Like, I literally feel it in my chest right now. Like, I want, like, you just made me want to start calling, bro. Like, <laughs> I straight up, I'm like, damn, yeah, like, it really, like, I'm about to watch that tomorrow morning, like, once I start yeah. on the phone. Bro, I watched that movie over 10 times for sure. Dude, it's such a good movie and it's such a good scene. Like, I know exactly what scene you're talking about. And, yo, mm -hmm. it really does work. And just like, right. Yo, at the end of the day, you have to do money producing items for your job. A lot of people exactly. get caught up in a busy work. But it's like, yo, picking up the phone and talking to sellers, that's money producing. That's income producing. If you're not doing income producing items, you're wasting time. You're doing busy work. Yeah. It's funny you say that, man, because I know I keep referring back to Pace, but we've picked up so many things from Pace and he calls the busy work mental masturbation. Yo, Basically, facts. like you're, you're like doing things that you feel like you're being productive. You're doing like admin work, you know, you're, you're doing all this paperwork or you're, you're doing basically nothing that produces you re revenue directly. Right. And so it makes you feel productive. But at the end of the day, when you kind of review your week, it's like, I haven't done anything, you know? Um, so yeah, I try to do, I, I try to save like anything like income generating activity. So whether it be texting, um, cold calling, primarily those two during the day when people are up and then anything that regards like, you know, pulling lists or sorting my data or putting things together, I'll do that at night, you know, or early in the morning, either or. I'm actually really happy you said that because a lot of people will utilize that work for the middle of the day. Oh, I'm yeah. going to go pull my list now. Oh, I'm going to go mm -hmm. research the properties now. It's like, why are you doing this now when this is the time to talk to sellers? There's, oh, there's a window. There is a right. window that you have access to talk to these people and they're not going to be as pissed off. You start calling mm -hmm. before 9 a.m., they're pissed off. You start calling after 8 p.m., they're pissed off, off rip. But if you mm -hmm. save those kind of works, like I used to, I used to, I still do it waking up at 5 a.m. And that's when I'll start doing the list pulling or running the numbers on the properties from the day before or whatever, right. that kind of work, Craigslist posting, Facebook's posting, all of that stuff comes before it's time to start talking to the sellers exactly. and then talking to sellers time. That's sacred time. You don't mess with that. Exactly. Exactly. So let me ask you now. You know, aside from the business, what are you doing for your, your mindset? You know, like, what do you, do you actively focus on growing your mindset? Is that something you put a lot of conscious effort into or is that just kind of like it happens on its own? Bro, I'm glad you asked that. That's a great question because I recently asked myself that question. You know, I'm, I'm over here, I'm building up my, my real estate skills, um, you know, and, and I'm learning, understanding all the lingo. I'm understanding how numbers work. At the same time, though, uh, I don't think that's the core. The core of it is definitely the mind, right? The mind is the, power, the most powerful tool you have. And so, um, man, it's funny because uh, I'm going to kind of retract because when you, when you, when you ask that statement, I remember a conversation I had with, uh, Matthew Simmons. So this is when I, we heard his, uh, I heard his um, interview with Steve Trang 
Mm-hmm. You know, my, Matt Simmons is also in the mentorship, right? Um, and it's funny because I, I reached out to him, but it was not a real estate related question. You know, part of the, the things that I got from him was how he was talking about, you know, when he was younger, he was being an entrepreneur, but he really just spent most of his time partying and just not like, you know, just like just doing whatever, right? Um, and just trying to hustle, but at the same time, not really focus on his mind. And then towards the end, he, he was talking about how he really guarded his mind and he didn't consume content. Like he didn't watch TV or he didn't, he tried to always, always watch and listen to positive things. And so when I talked to him, I was, you know, just messaging, I was like, Hey, you know, I, one of the things that I've been dealing with is uh, kind of like lack of discipline and lack of consistency. And, you know, um, and what I mean by that is there are days when I just feel like I don't want to do anything. There are days when I don't want to keep pushing because to put it, basically when you're hunting for that first deal, you have all that drive in the world. But now when you have a couple of deals under your belt, how do you, sometimes there's, there's, there's either people that want to keep pushing until they really reach that goal. Or there's people like, Oh, I feel like I've kind of made it now. And uh, I, you know, I just kind of relax a little bit and I'm not going to lie. I've, I've gotten a little bit into that mindset a little bit. Um, but, and that's why I reached out to Matt. I was like, Hey, what, what did you do to make sure that you stay consistent and, and just stay disciplined? And that's literally what he said. Like he, he has a saying where he um, kind of really just does whatever he can to guard his mind, right? And that's by making sure that he's not um, consuming the wrong things, making sure that he's always listening to a lot of positive things. And he definitely is a big proponent of the book, The Secret, uh, the, what is it? The, the Secret, uh, secret wait, what is it? Um, secret Millionaire Mind or oh, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. Yep. That's what it is. Um, and he's talking about how every single morning he, he makes his declarations and he talks about how, and he talks about the things that he's grateful for, um, and how abundant his life is. And just by saying those things out loud, it really kind of just really puts that energy out there. And at first I was just like, man, this, that, that's just like all hoopla right in my head. But really it's just now that I'm kind of practicing a little bit of those things, I'm seeing it kind of change, you know? So Mindset is definitely an area that is lacking for me. Um, and, I, and I realize that, though. That's the best part. And I realize that I'm doing anything I can to kind of improve that. You know, I, I realize that real estate is up here, but I think my mindset is down here, right? And so when it comes to that, it's, it's definitely listening to, um, listening to, like, you know, a lot of audio books that pertain to, to mindset. Um, another thing is, you know, I, I'm, I'm a strong believer of, uh, in the faith, you know, I'm a Christian. And so uh, with my guys, sometimes we do Bible study. Um, uh, we'll do like, we'll have community, basically community is like a small group, right? We'll just kind of come together, fellowship and just talk about our weeks. We're just really guarding my mind and really trying to encourage one another. Um, yeah, man. So mindset is very, very important. I think if you don't have the right mindset going into this business, though, you'll fail miserably. Dude, I'm happy to hear you say that because my whole premise behind this show, the entire theory is that mindset comes first, ultimately, that Mm -hmm. you're never going to achieve true success. It might be outward success to everybody else, but you're never truly going to grasp success unless you take care of the mindset first. And that's ultimately where it comes from because success isn't having a million houses. It's not having the fastest cars or the most successful business success is you being able to achieve your dreams, your goals, your desires, and you being happy with your decisions and the choices you make and you genuinely enjoying every aspect of your life. Even the stuff that you don't like, you know that it was ultimately your choice. So it's just being in the driver's seat, consciously in the driver's seat of your own life. So Mm -hmm. I'm happy to hear you say that. I'm happy to hear that you, you know, you have the the Christian fellowship group that you work with. I actually noticed that when I went on your Facebook, I was like, oh, this is cool. Like this guy's actually into his faith. He's proud of it. Like he shares it out loud. And I think, I mean, I see it, man. Like, I don't even think I know it for a fact. A lot of the men in our society, we don't like, that's not something we're praised for, for being a man of God, being a man of faith, for talking about this kind of stuff, like talking about mindset. Like you said, it's a mumble jumble to a lot of us, like growing up, if you start telling me go read a self self help book, I'm going to be like, why would I read a self help book? Why? Like, it's, I don't need that stuff. Like I'm not an idiot. I can help myself. Like that's like, I downplayed that stuff big time. And then you think about it. Well, if I wanted to 
learn how to play basketball, I would go and find the coach and I would listen to everything he said and I would let him teach me. If I wanted to learn how to fix a car, I would go buy a book or go watch a YouTube video and have them teach right. me how to do this. So if right. I want to be a better human, be the best version of myself, why would I not pick up a book that pretty much teaches me how to utilize this crazy body exactly. and brain that I was born with? Like it's exactly. just backwards thinking, but it's a lot of guys were just not we don't put this on the pedestal. We don't talk about this stuff. We don't share and highlight the fact that all of us that have reached success, we do this. Like we actively work on growing our mindset and it's right. like a daily ritual. The same way you eat every single day, the same way you shower every single day, you got to also water the garden of your mind. And if you don't yeah. take care of that soil, nothing could possibly grow there. I think that's, I think that's, yeah, that's a great point, man, because I think growing your mind is probably the hardest thing you can do. I think anybody can learn anything else other than that. I think anybody can learn how to become a real estate investor. I think anybody can learn how to become a stock trader or fix cars or play basketball, right, on their own. But to grow your mindset, man, that takes a different type of discipline that, like, really, you got to go out of your comfort zone and just kind of go into, like, an existential mode, you know, to, to really reach another level that you didn't even know existed, right? Because when, when, you're, when you're, like, trying to pick up a new skill, it's very um, tangible to see the improvements that you made. For example, right, basketball. Um, let's say you're terrible. You, you can't make a couple buckets, right? Next thing you know, you're keep practicing your form. You're, you're doing certain things to make sure that your, your elbow's tucked in. And then all of a sudden, you're making a bunch of touch. That's tangible. But in terms of mindset, you know, that, that's not as tangible, man. It's not something that you can actually touch and feel. Uh, and so I think that's why growing your mindset is so, so difficult, you know? Um, and I, I just think that, I think it takes someone to really just sit down and really understand like, wow, I think I've, like when you see yourself become successful, you don't see how like you build your real estate skills. You see how your mindset has grown. You see that you consistently wake up early in the morning. You consistent, are you're disciplined about the time that you expend to certain tasks. You know how to time block. I think time block is another skill, but that also comes with mindset, being disciplined and staying within that, that period of time and then moving on to a different task. Yep. Right. The discipline to continue to, um, continue to go to the gym every single day. You know, that's not, that's not, go, that's not lifting weight skill. That's a mindset skill to be able to get yourself out of bed and just move and be active, you know? So yeah, man, I think um, it, it's, 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 it's so hard to grow a mindset and I've come to realize that, you know, and I, and I wish I took it more seriously because I'm, I was just kind of blowing it off, not thinking it was a big deal, but now I see the, the true importance of it. Dude, I'm, I, I'm so happy to hear you say that, man, because you're on the path, though. Like, once you make that awareness and you have that realization and then you start to get on that path of saying, like, yo, I'm starting now. I'm starting today. And you're actively growing it because you recognize that that mindset, it transcends whatever you choose, man. Like, I love guys like Kobe Bryant, right? When yeah. before Kobe had passed, you know, he had retired from the NBA. Hey, there we go. Rest in peace, man. Before he had passed, man, he went and he transitioned all of the discipline and all the work that he did on his mindset, the Mamba mentality. He took that from basketball and yeah. then he brought it over into this new space of storytelling. Right. And a lot of people were just like, where did this guy come from? Like, how did he just transition from this full career of the NBA into this next career? And he immediately did well. He immediately won a Grammy. He had a very successful right. podcast. He had books written that were ready to go. And it was all the same. He, was, he speaks about it. He says it was the same basic foundation of like the same discipline I put into the basketball. I now just transitioned it over here into my new area. And that right. came from the mindset. The mindset was ultimately the tool that lets him go and do whatever he wants. Michael Jordan was another example. Like, although he was quote unquote trash at baseball, you got to think about it. He still made it into the major leagues of baseball. Like that right. in and of itself is just a crazy feat. But how yeah. did he do that? He took the same sort of obsessive idea and the obsessive nature of himself from basketball, put it over there. Yeah. So it's cool. And a lot of people that. were saying that for Michael Jordan, when if he actually would play baseball a little bit longer, they were saying that he would definitely would have made it to the majors. Without a doubt. You know, and that just shows that that's definitely coming from someone that hasn't touched a baseball since he was in high school or college. Right. Because that was his primary sport. Originally it was baseball. 
And so now he's trying to pick up a baseball, like, you know, 15, 10, 15 years later. And they were saying that without a doubt, a couple years of development, he would have made it to the majors, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's just crazy. Cause he had know? this tool, man. So yeah. I want to respect your time, man. Cause I did want to keep you on here for an hour. So I got these two questions that I have as final questions. I like to ask every single guest that comes on the show. First one is a pretty basic question, which is what's, one or two of your favorite books that you've found recently that you've tapped into. It could be financial bo finance books. It could be self-development. It could be fictional. It could be anything, but what are one to two books that have really changed the way you mm -hmm. do things? Man. So uh, the first book uh, pretty much is going to be everybody's book that gets into real estate. It's rich dad, poor dad. Good stuff. Right. Um, it's because like after the 10 X conference, um, I started getting to a lot of reading. And so that was one of the, you know, books that I've read. And it's funny, I talk to a lot of people like, oh yeah, I know about that book. I see it on my shelf, just collecting dust. Or it's my, it's my parents' book, yeah. You know, but it still holds so much truth to it today. So definitely I refer, I've read that book twice. Second book, huge, huge, man, huge, huge game changer for me is Gold Giver. And you know, yes. I want to shout out to Pace for, for referring that to me because that's probably my top, Honestly, it's probably like my top two books. I mean, Rich Dad and Poor Dad and Go Giver are my two favorite books because Go Giver just talks about if you look out for others, people's interest and you just base your life around giving, you know, you'll get that back tenfold and it, you give with the mindset of not receiving anything um, and you'll be surprised at how far you'll go. And so I, I've read that book twice and I'm going to read it again for sure because there's so many gems from that book you can take away and I, you learn something new. And Pace is a, is a, resemblance a walking resemblance of go-giver you know um and so and now that you see that though you see his business just continue to grow and grow you know and it's because he's given so much value that people are almost willing to do anything for pace right whether it's to send him deals um in different cities or or, or whatever it is right provide value to him and so it's because pace told himself that his life is going to be around giving value and helping people grow you know, I remember Pace when he posted on the story, you know, when, when, when I die, I want you guys to do this. I want you guys to go play a round of golf on behalf of me. And then after that, I want you to get back to work and, and give value and give back uh, to your community and just continue to work. And when he said that, I was just like, wow, this dude is literally a true go-giver, yep. you know? Um, and so that, that's the best thing you can do, man. It's just to really help someone and, 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 and make an impact on their life without receiving any return. I think that's just in a, a feeling that you, that you can't mimic anywhere else. Dude, I love it. And that's a hard one for people to do because I know they start to question like, am I being an idiot? Should I be getting something out of this? Am I wasting my time? And you know, it's like, but ultimately you, you have to do it. And you can't always even like tell people like, Hey, this is what I did because they're going to say like, Oh, well, it sounds like that other person just took advantage of you. It's like, no, like, this is what you do. You give. Yeah. And I, you know, um, man, I, uh, um, not going to lie when, when people started reaching out to me and asking for my help in terms of, you know, Hey, do you think this is a good deal or underwriting or talking to their sellers? Right. There's like, not that I'm saying it personally, but I have like thoughts sometimes like, man, am I, um, I guess being taken advantage of, am I, am I, should I be paid for compensated for this? Right. Or should I, um, you know, my time is, my time is valuable. I'm not going to lie. It is right. But should I be wasting it on them? But at the end of the day, man, it's just like, you know, I, I was once in their shoes and I know people poured into me. And so now it's my job to pour into these people. Right. And I'm not saying I've made it yet. I, I'm far from that, but any value that I can give to those people, I will wholeheartedly do it 100% without receiving anything, without expecting to receive anything in return. Right. Um, that man, I think it's just in the energy of the universe, man. You give, you give, and you'll, you'll surprise and get it back tenfold. Dude, I love that, man. And like, I think a lot of people, like, you're almost making me want to go to the whiteboard for this, man. Cause like, a lot of people, <laughs> they think, like, all right, when I get to the top, right, that's when I'm gonna, at that place, I'll turn around and I'll be able to pull everybody up. It's like, yo, you got to remember, if you're all the way up there at the top, your arm's not long enough to reach down to those people mm. down there that you actually oh, want to help good. out. So yeah. along the way, you need to be doing it. Someone's going to be pulling you up. And then before you go too far along, you need to turn around and see who's there. You pull them up. And now it's their responsibility to do what you just did in that position. And that way, everyone kind of keeps this conveyor belt moving. But yeah. it's like, 
it's easy to say that when you when you've made it you'll give but when when you start to realize man you might not be the same person you are now when you actually make it you know all these people hitting you up you're gonna blow them off you're gonna not want to respond um and it's just like you only network with people that you feel are of value to you which is unfortunate that all people change you know when it gets to that point and so this also helps me keep grounded, keeps me grounded knowing that, you know, if I can do this now, I know I can do this in the future um, when I make it, you know? Um, so yeah, man, it's just, like I said, you know, developing the, uh, developing a, a habit for that, right? Yep. Uh, just to continue to pour into these people. Cause if you can do it now, you'll definitely be able to do it in the future when you have, when you have something right now, I have nothing. You know, I don't consider myself successful in any way, but um, I know that if I continue to pour into people now, I know I'll do it later. Absolutely. And it's like you watch. I'm so grateful like that we have the mentor pace because like I got to, when I went out to Arizona, dude, like I saw it. I was like, holy crap, like this guy is the real deal. Like he doesn't stop. He keeps going. And he had to build up just like how Kobe Bryant built up his endurance to be able to play these games, to be able to play all four quarters. Pace is in the same position where he's building himself up to be able to last all day and to give all day and right. pour into other people all day long and it's funny like i asked him a question i was like dude what do you do oh no i said how do you not get burnt out and then like i realized like nah you know what it doesn't matter who you are everyone gets burnt out so it's like what do you do to prevent from getting burnt out and he kind of recognized like all right you figured it out because like even he he gets burnt out but he built himself up he thought about it as a marathon so he's yeah. slowly building his endurance to give and he finds ways to recharge and he knows where his breaking points are. And then those mm. times he will go get away and then he can come back to continue to give. Yeah. Because I, at the rate that he's going, man, you, you have to wonder like, where is this dude getting all this energy from? Because, you know, you hear about him getting three, four hours of sleep every night. Um, you hear about he's active on social media, constantly just giving value back. And he's constantly on Zoom calls with us. And it's just like, where does this dude, all, this, this dude, like, we're all human. This dude has to get burnt out in some form or fashion. And he has a family too, you know, wife and kids. And um, it, it's just like, man, this dude is so spread thin, but you do, it does not seem like that in any sort of way. So, you know, when you said that he, he had to recharge and he had to get away, you know, that's totally understandable, man. Yep. Um, but I don't think I'm at the point where I'm spreading myself too thin. I want to get to that point, to be honest. To be completely honest, I want to get to that point because that's when I know that I gave like my full effort in doing everything I can. Dude, I love to hear that, man. I'm excited to hear about your experience when you get there because I know personally, I, I've gotten there, not in the real estate world, but in other areas of my life. Mm -hmm. And holy crap, you know, we'll have a conversation about it when you get there. Like when it <laughs> happens to you, just you're going to think about me saying this right now. And I want you to just like pick up the phone, give me a call and be like, yo, I think I know what you're like. About. I've come close. Like I've come close. And sometimes it's like, it's overwhelmed me in a sense that, man, I can't go to sleep sometimes because I'm constantly thinking about things or there's so many things to do on my checklist, right? That, that's just overwhelming. I have so many missed calls on my phone because I'm so busy. I, I can't talk to these people, you know? Um, but I've gone to that point, but I don't think I'm actually consistently there. And right. I know Pace is, I, I, honestly, I think Pace is there, but he's like, like thriving there. Dude, that's the thing he told me. He also said pretty much a good way to not get burnt out. And this was advice that was given to me by someone else as well, like an area in the time of my life where I got crazy burnt out. You got to mm -hmm. find something that as much as you give, it also like gives back into you. So it becomes a bit of a feedback loop. So it's like, yeah, like pace gives, but also a part of his giving is like, there's this emotional and energetic recharging that's happening at the same time. And maybe it's like, it's not happening at the exact same speed. So he is being, drained a little bit more than he is being refilled so it eventually does need to stop but for right. the most part he's found like a nice ratio where that's it's like good. as it gets poured out something new is pouring in right that's like right. one of the that, that's a concept of go-giving bro the the fifth concept is being able to receive as well yep you know you have to yeah. you have to be able to receive mm -hmm. so let me ask you now this is like my final question and i like seriously love this question it's like one of my favorites if you woke up tomorrow and you had no memory of anything. You didn't remember your name. You didn't remember who you were, what you've done, any of the technical skills that you've built up until now. You don't remember any of the relationships you have, like nothing. You are a blank slate. However, you do retain one piece of wisdom, one piece of knowledge that you know to be true. You're not going to question it. It's just in your mind. 
and you don't think about, man, why do I know this is true? Why don't I question? Like you just run with it. What do you want that one bit of wisdom to be? Oh man. Um, this might sound cliche. I don't know if you've gotten an answer like this already. Um, but it's definitely knowing that, that God is real. Ooh. And I think that's like the foundation for everything. You know, when you believe God is real, then you believe other things like about love, right? Then you think, start believing about grace. And then that just goes into the go-giving concept and, and all that stuff. Because I think go-giver is a huge, it's like a, it's like an extension of the Bible because the Bible talks about that consistently all the time. You know, really, if you think about it, Jesus came down on this earth to give, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that's probably my one thing. And I think if I started with that at my core, um, I think I, it would be easy for me to get back to where I am today or even further, you know? Um, whether it be in real estate, whether it be in another, um, another space, you know? Um, so th that's probably the one thing, man. Yeah. Dude, I absolutely love it, man. I, I completely agree. And I wish it was something I tapped into when I was younger, but I was one of those kids that like rebelled against the church and rebelled against religion. So I completely like, yeah, and I can, I can see that, man. Cause like, you know, when you're, um, well, as a kid, you know, you, you always, you all, all you want to do is have fun and, and going to church wasn't really considered fun. It was just like, oh man, it's Sunday, we gotta go to church, you know? But now when you're kind of older and you, you're at a point where you can understand certain things, um, you, you kind of realize what, what the Bible has, the content and what God can do to change your life. You know, I've seen crazy, I, I've seen crazy testimonials, man, where people have done a full 180 and um, you would not have believed it. You know, um, where you have your typical, you know, drug addicts, uh, prostitutes, your um, uh, like money, money addictions, gambling problems that all go away and them being like a true servant of God. It's just like, what happened? You know, how, how did you become like that? It, like, it just doesn't make sense. Like it defies all laws of on this earth, and physics, and gravity, all of that. You know, yeah. how does that happen? You know? <laughs> Yeah, um, man. When so to me, that's like the that's like the the real truth, man. That I think I would abide by for the rest of my life. Dude, I love that, man. Like you're working with higher power, and that's it's real. You know, it's like, and a lot of the, like I have a lot of young listeners that listen to this show, and I want you guys to hear that. Like, it's not mumbo jumbo. It's not like us trying to tell you because we're your parents or we're old. Like, we're just trying to let you know if you want to know what's allowing us to do the things we do, us to be successful, us to find new ways of figuring things out. It's not just us. We're working with a higher power. Right. Every last human on this earth has access to that higher power. And it's up to you to build your own personal relationship with that higher power, whether you call him God, whether you call it the universe, whatever you yep. call it, it's the higher power. Like right. I don't care if you call a rose a rose or if you call it something else, it's still what it is. And right. You right. Relationship with. And you know, if I ever get criticized for promoting, for promoting God and promoting Jesus, then you know, I'm doing my job to be completely honest, you know, um, because I think for me to be on this earth and, and not promote uh, who my God is and what I believe in, then, you know, then what? there's no purpose for me on this life, to be honest. And so people might be like, oh my gosh, how can you talk about your opinions like that? You know, this is so biased or yada, yada, but you know, it, it's what I firmly believe in. If anything, I encourage people to be open-minded. That's the one thing I encourage people to do, just be open-minded and you know kind of be a little bit receptive to these to these things you know you never i'm just literally talking about what my experiences are you know what i've seen and what i've experienced you know um and it's just really miraculous and it'd be it'd be a disservice of me if i did not share what i've been going through right because you don't know who like you said you have a lot of young listeners you don't there's some there's someone that would benefit from this message and i know it you know for a hundred percent you know, they're like, oh man, you know, this dude is kind of, you know, he's, he's kind of doing, he's doing all right in real estate. You know, he's, he's on Marlon's podcast. That must mean something, right? But he's also a firm believer of Jesus. And before, you know, my parents were just talking, like sometimes we don't believe our parents. We always think that right. we're right. You know, but now it's just like when you hear some, from someone else other than your parent, but from someone that's not your elder, you're like, oh wow, you know, he, they might be onto something. Yeah. And it's cool because like, it's coming from like you, like you're a young, cool dude. Like it's like straight up, like we don't see this from 
like the men in our age group, we're not talking about this. We're not promoting this. And the people that are promoting it are like these crazy old people. That's like, it's like that mountain scenario. It's like, all right, you're too high up on a mountain. Like, I don't relate to you. Your arm doesn't reach down to me, but you and I are in like this perfect position where we're still close enough to them to reach down to them and show them like, yo guys, like don't waste what you have right now. Like start tapping into it sooner. Like we're telling you, we're only a little ways ahead of you. And if we could have tapped into it while we were in your position, it would have been a game changer. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. You know, part of the one thing I try not to do is have regrets, but the one regret I do have is like, like you said, not starting earlier. Right. But I'm sure there's a lot of people who are older than me and you, and they had those same regrets when they wish they could have started what we're we're, we're doing now. Right. So that's one regret I have, but I, I try my best not to have it because I know that I'm grateful to be in this position. I think I had to go through what I went through in the past to be aware of at now. You know, and some people are just quicker than others and that's okay. Dude, I love it. So, yo, Jimmy, first off, thank you, man, for coming on. Like, this has been insanely valuable for me. I really enjoy getting to connect with you. I think that you're somebody that I can see growing into the future with and having a strong relationship. Sure. I'm glad that you were able to share your story. I believe it's going to be extremely valuable to a lot of the listeners that come on. I want guys, like, if you listen to this episode and you got value, make sure you share it. Share it with your friends tag Jimmy. Jimmy, real quick, if people want to find you on social media, where can they go? What should they look up? For sure. Uh, Instagram is the best way to reach me. Um, it's at T, uh, thy Jimmy, T-H-Y Jimmy. Um, I, I try to change my name to Jimmy Gold, but it's taken. So <laughs> maybe, maybe one day when, I'm, when I make it, I'll pay for it or something. <laughs> so guys, I'll put that link in the description below. You'll be able to find Jimmy's IG. Reach out, send him a DM, tag him, let him know that you heard this episode. Let him know if there was anything that really stood out to you that was valuable. Just shoot him a message. Let him know because it helps for us to know that this message is reaching somebody. And the same way Pace was able to help Jimmy, Jimmy might be in a position where he can really help you, but he doesn't know you exist yet until you reach out and say something. So sure. For sure. Dude, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, bro. Thanks for having me, man. This is, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, it's honestly an honor to, to be uh, um, having my first podcast with you, bro. Seriously. Oh, heck yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs>